you know what? Now is the hour. You are right. I'd like to open <laughs> this uh, joint meeting of the select board and those trustees. Come to order. I'd like to call the uh, village trustees uh, joint session with the select board to order as well. All right, proceed. Help me. Well, oh, this no. is the second of the public <laughs> yeah. from the amendments to the town plan. Correct. Sally's here to I am here. explain it all to us. So I will say what I said last time, and that is that um, we made changes to the energy plan, we updated it, and made significant changes to include um, enough criteria to allow us to be a an enhanced energy town, which means that we get um, a say in any um, commercial arrays, um, renewable energy arrays that are, are built in this community. But we also updated a lot more of the energy plan, so that's all new. And at the same time, we actually have to readopt the entire town plan. So um, when we passed it by the Regional Planning Commission, they asked us to update a few other sections. And those are the other small amendments that are also included in the packet. So we have um, an updated capital improvements section um, and a few changes on, let me see if I can get my things right here, economic development, education, natural elements, public <coughs> transportation, and land use are the changes. And all of those, you should have a packet that has the um, yellow line. Um, most of them are pretty minor. Um, we will be working on the education section. We have a meeting tomorrow night, actually, that's an open meeting to discuss um, that chapter. Um, I don't expect we'll do that quickly, so this is why we'd like to get this town plan update um, approved by you. So what's our next move, Sally? Well, you have to, if there are any uh, uh, minor adjustments, um, we can do those tonight. Um, and then you just, you have, to, you have to pass it and say, yes, we approve of this. So do you want, I made several, I made a couple yep. of mine and you want to go through those? Yep. Okay. Uh, they will, so some of them, most of them are on the capital improvements page. The third one. It's right at the beginning, the third page. Um, so the second paragraph, the in the sewer department, we're replacing the roof. We're not putting solar panels up. We've made the roof so that it could take solar panels if we decide to want them. What was the reason for going away from it financially? Oh, we actually don't need extra energy, the extra electricity at the moment. The, um, the, the agreement that we have with North Solar Technologies should cover our needs, and we need to. We, we thought we should run that for a year. It only it came online in July, so it's much later than we anticipated. So we should see where we are after a year and see if we can benefit from more electricity. Otherwise, the payback isn't there. Right. So is that two hundred thousand still a valid figure mm. for the roof? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you could simply add the word potentially solar panels. You could, but. Wouldn't it make sense to, I mean, couldn't the power be allocated someplace else yeah. from there, or it would just be stuck? I mean, isn't that a great spot if we wanted extra power it is a great spot. to be utilized somewhere uh, else? It is a great spot, and the roof is designed so that it can bear the weight of solar panels, but as a town and village, uh, we don't, we're not sure that we need the extra electricity. We're, so we're maxed out right now. We think we are, but we didn't come online until July, so... Okay. We'll wait 12 months Thank you. and then we can get it. So why don't you add the word potentially? Yep. Um, and then the other one was that the library, um, the, they've raised 500000 for what they believe the system will cost, not 200 Oh, that's correct. I can't believe how fast they did that. <coughs> yes. It's interesting, insane. isn't it? And then um, uh, we have estimated costs of the town hall rejuvenation at one hundred to 200000 I think it could be... Why don't we just say over two hundred thousand? Yeah. Yes. Well. <coughs> and then I just have a question about the elementary landscaping at the bottom of the page. Is this um, additional to what's already been done? I don't know. Is that all? That? 
Um, I, I think there is some there is some additional things that were proposed, and I think that that's what that covers. Okay. I believe Michael researched that, so okay. that's another thing came up. And then my other what was a comment that I read through the energy chapter, yeah. and it just seems like uh, we've been talking about the regional energy coordinator, and there's quite a lot of things in here that a person would be able to affect if they were devoting their time to. Any other comments? There's nothing in there about sidewalks. There's nothing in there about sidewalks. In the energy thing? No, in the, uh, in the capital, in the capital, capital improvement. No, I mean, there's, there's several other capital improvements that we might want to do. Yeah, I, I, that should absolutely be a high priority. The yes, amount of people who trip and it. fall on our sidewalks, is that the reputation we want when somebody does get injured or breaks a leg? I mean, we should be getting those things done. Um, I will just say that we anticipate that we will be coming back to you probably in the next three or four months to do an updated education chapter, and so there will be an opportunity of, to update these as well at that time. Okay. And that might be an easier way to go than trying to word spend the time. Yes. yes, and we can certainly add that piece about energy coordinator as right? part of the yeah. action plan of the energy yeah. system. Okay. So we can go back to definitely. Part. I mean. The, this is the thing is that you, re you have to readopt the entire plan even if you just make minor changes. So that's why we're, we're, we're playing catch up a little bit, um, but we didn't want to wait until we had this education conversation to, to start over, because that could be several months. And we wanted to get the energy plan in place, which has been written now for six months. So we're ready to go on that. So in adopting the energy plan that you wrote mm -hmm with the revisions that have been mentioned this evening, the changes. Um, in doing that this evening, we would readopt the entire town plan? Yes, you're going to readopt the entire town plan. The only changes I've heard are the three changes that were made to capital improvements. And those, so that's nothing to do with the energy section. So, okay. so yes, you are readopting the entire, the entire town plan. You cannot do it piece by piece. And then we'll have to do that again in three to four months? When right. they do the education. Right. But what I meant is the energy part that is here tonight, we adopt. adopt. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and the other uh, changes that Michael sent along okay. are also part of this re-adoption. So do we vote on it tonight? You should vote on it. That would be great. Should, this is the second public yes. hearing yes. that so we needed to have. We both need to have a motion. I move that we approve the new additions to the village plan, town and village plan, um, with the inclusion of the three edits that were made tonight. As, as well as, as approving well as, the entire. Uh, as well as approving the entire village and town plan. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Select board. I'll make the same motion for the town. Motion seconded. Made, seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Okay. I move that we. Yes, there are other business. Yes, there is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> from our side, uh, some quick uh, other business. Uh, first of all, there's. Uh, WJJR Catamount Radio um, has asked if they could be present during Halloween um, to give out, uh, to broadcast. They want a van located um, in the village where kids are walking. They want to give out uh, tickets to a Richard Marks concert. They want to give out candy bars. And uh, they want a place for their van. And I spoke to uh, Officer Swanson. He said the great place would be on the other side of the barricade, just one vehicle uh, uh, ahead of the barricade on Cross Street. And uh, so I would suggest that if we're in agreement, we approve pending final police department decision on where their van could be located if they'd like to broadcast from here. So moved. I'll second. 
Okay, any other discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Just Aye. Watson was right out there. Yeah, he just went outside. Oh, well, well, he already discussed, discussed it with him. Discussed it with him earlier. The other piece of business is something to announce to. Yeah, he just returned. <laughs> something to announce to the board, both boards, is that we have picked five members for the uh, search committee, and that have agreed to, to to search. And I know you have as well, Mary. The five that. Uh, we uh, have approved our Anna Di Vitale, John Spector, Courtney Lowe, Elizabeth Reeves, and Joe Boyd. And they've all agreed uh, to the confidentiality and to the schedule. And they will all be present and all able to view the resumes here in the town hall. And I have chosen to serve with me. Um, Kaya Pickett, Gail Devine, Susan Ford, and Matt Powers. And I have a little, do you know Kaya? Do you know him? He grew up here in Woodstock. He returned here to raise his family. He started a business and has taken a low key interest in community affairs. He was recommended by another member of the select board. And following a brief conversation, I realized his interest in Woodstock is deep and strong. Gail Devine grew up in Pomfret. She's the executive director at the Rec Center, operates a public building on a tight budget, which includes an endowment. She answers to a board of directors, the facilitators of the endowment as well, with a dotted line responsibility somewhat to the town. Her resilience after Tropical Storm Irene and her participation in the restoration of the Little Theater after the storm's devastation was impressive. Gail works well with the town in a cooperative effort and shares in the responsibility of maintaining Vale Field. Susan Ford has been an active, active business owner in Woodstock for some time and a resident for 30 years. Active in community affairs, volunteers on boards, and gives her time to nonprofit groups willing to take time to complete special assignments as requested and works to maintain the quality of life in Woodstock. She has also had experience in this type of endeavor. And Matt Powers, the executive director of the Woodstock History Center, he has quickly become aware of the importance of the historic nature of the town and village, especially the people who have and will continue to make Woodstock interesting. He has an appreciation for Woodstock historic buildings and their preservation. He lends the element of historic appreciation to this search, which is so imperative in Woodstock's public affairs. I didn't prepare the details. I didn't prepare details. I didn't prepare details. I spoke to Joe, who was in Alabama just half an hour ago. <laughs> that sounds like just like what she did. Yeah. <laughs> How's he doing? <laughs> I, think, I think most of us know <laughs> the people <laughs> that I mentioned. And I, I think it's, it's interesting. So that it's, it's, I think it's 10 great people, and it's five women and five men. Uh, oh, it is even <laughs> Yes, it is. And uh, it should be a very good group to do that preliminary work for both our boards. So I'd like to thank Mary for that and some yeah, job. Welcome. And, and thank you for wherever she is on your board for and, 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 and I think it's going to be a good process. I'm looking forward. I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> Some of those that I um, that are going to serve with me uh, may be here tonight. I wasn't sure when we would have this opportunity, and they know that I was going to put the names forward today. So um, they may come in. If so, we'll recognize them at that time. Okay, thank you. I make a motion to um, adjourn for the trustees. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. The meeting is adjourned. I'll make that motion for the second. Oh, no. Yeah, you, you guys, guys are staying. We're, we're, we're hanging. Uh -huh. we're we're the, we have to adjourn from the, the joint, joint meeting. meeting. Yeah. Okay, we'll adjourn. Make that motion to adjourn the joint meeting. And do I have a second for I'll this? Second. Motion been made. Seconded to adjourn the joint meeting. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, back there. We should have yeah, mentioned to him that we talked about. Okay.
I'm going to call this meeting of the Board of Selectmen of September 17th uh, to order. Uh, first thing on the agenda is there, are there are there any additions to the posted agenda? No. None. Okay. Any citizens' comments, please? Um, I want to state your name. My name is Beth Finlayson from the Chamber and um, on a working group of the revitalization. And if it would be at all possible to enlist some help from the town employees around the 1st of October to help pick up the flower pots, um, it would be appreciated. Can you please coordinate that with uh, the town manager? Sure. <laughs> 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 Any other citizens' comments this time? Uh, we have interviews for the EC uh, fiber candidates. We have Dan Orkut and um, Alex Rojack. Rojack and Jennifer Baxter and Chris McCloy. Chris? He's here for EDC. Oh, the EDC. Oh, EDC. oh I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. It's just two oh, for EDC. Two. Yep, okay. Dan Arquette. And Dan is here. Alex. Alex here. Alex, um, was coming from Boston and got stuck in a little traffic. He was hoping to be here by 615, 630 at the latest. Okay. He's coming. Dan? Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Dan Orchett. Um, I was uh, involved with EC Fiber before. I was on the, an alternate on the governing board. Um, I ended up going off from the board because I, there was a possibility that I might be moving from Woodstock Turns out that I, that did not happen, and at the time um, I was asked to uh, to be from the EC Fiber side. They wanted me to be the main delegate, and I I there's politics at play. Those things have evened out now, and I would like to be involved again if that's possible. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. <coughs> <coughs> and do we have anything from Alex except for his, uh... He may be along. I was going to say, he may be, he may be along. Okay. Set by 615. Yeah, we'll so table it. Okay. We'll kind of give him a, All right. a couple minutes. So now the EDC, EDC candidates. Is Jennifer here? Yes. Yeah, <coughs> and Chris is here. Yes. Ladies first. <laughs> okay. Sure. So my name is Jennifer Baxter. I'm a Woodstock resident. I moved here back in 2015, bought a home, and I was from the Killington Rutland area. I was active on the chambers there, on chamber board at Killington, involved in the Rutland Chamber of Commerce. I'm just interested in getting. Um, back involved with the community now that I'm here. I moved here after my oldest daughter graduated Rutland High School and bought a home right here. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> have, you, have you been to any of the meetings? Do you know what they're, what's involved, what they do? I have not. As Killington was forming their EDC, I attended a couple of theirs. Um, that's when I was on the chamber. So that was years ago, back in 2012. But no, I have not been to any Woodstock ones. I've heard a little bit about it. I've heard good things. I've heard maybe not so good things but you know i've heard stuff <laughs> have you, have you uh, been reading to see what the initiatives are and how they're hoping to yes. re establish yeah. themselves I have the re most recent article in the paper the other day do you have any views on how you if they all the money was yours how you'd spend it well i'm a big proponent of travel and tourism uh, the chamber and, and supporting beth of course and all of her initiatives i think it's a big vital part of our what we what would stock to keep it sustainable here um but yeah, I'm a big supporter of, of that. I think I would probably lean that direction. I currently am the Director of Finance for Advanced Transit, which is uh, a nonprofit community transportation system out of the Upper Valley. 
and uh, so I have some finance and HR background as well. And, and when you think about Woodstock and its future, what do you think are the pressing issues for Woodstock? Pressing issues? Well, I'm only three years into the, into the um, community. I, I just think uh, having Bentleys closed, the, the travel and tourism, just making it attractive for uh, visitors to want to come, come here, stay here, come back here, live here, settle here. Um, I think that's a big uh, thing. I didn't realize how serious of an interview this was. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just came for work, so you're, I'm like, oh, you're good. You're fine. It's awesome. So, what sparked your interest to be here tonight to apply for this? What what got you? I was just looking for something to get back involved, and I wrote. I know Frank from our uh, his grandchildren, my children, ski race together. Um, I saw it in the. My husband mentioned it to me. Rich, um, I'm married to Rich Kozlowski. I just. It was, a, it was an opening. Uh, I thought, okay, I can do this. I have um, some community background. I have some chamber background. I love travel and tourism. Um, I used to own an inn for six years, so I know it very well. Not as well as Beth, because she's been living, eating, and breathing it for years and years, but you know, I, I know a little bit about, about it, having owned a business that benefits from it and needs it, um, so. Okay, you can see where they would work. The EDC and the Chamber of Commerce need to work. They together. absolutely need to work together. Absolutely. Um, can't have one without the other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Chris. Hello, uh, I'm Chris McElroy. I am a Relatively new Woodstock resident. We moved our family here this year, in fact. Uh, my wife and I and our two children who have started at Woodstock Elementary. And, you know, uh, got up here. We were enamored with the town. We moved from Metro DC area. Didn't really have a community there. We loved the community here. And got up and took a look, took, sort of scoped out the area and realized that this was a place we wanted to raise our children. My wife and I kind of have a long history of getting involved. So I looked at EDC and thought this is a, an opportunity where I think I can make a difference. So that sparked my interest and really started a series of conversations with people in the town about what was great here, what needed more work. So I did a lot of listening and EDC seemed like because of the subcommittees that you have and the mission that it has, an area where I might be able to make a difference. And so I've <coughs> been in the tech sector for 20 years now, started a couple small businesses, so I have a lot of sympathy and affection for small business owners, of which Woodstock has plenty. So that's an area I think where I might be able to be helpful. And uh, also looking at some of the food and beverage and outdoor natural kind of inherent advantages that Woodstock has. I looked at the EDC as a, as a space I might be able to make an impact for the town. So it sparked my interest. Any questions for Chris? Um, Go ahead. Well, I wondered what you saw as some of the most pressing issues for Woodstock. I think that right now it's kind of at a crossroads for a few things, which is you've got individuals and families starting to move back into Woodstock and we've seen that at the school. I've talked to a number of people who've kind of reflected that back to me. So <coughs> affordable housing is one issue, trying to find ways to make it uh, easier for individuals and families to, to live in Woodstock. I think also improving the school, I've talked to a number of folks on the board have sort of reflected back that they've got some uh, issues there from a growth <coughs> perspective and sort of absorbing that growth. And then I think sort of business friendly environment as well. We'd love to be able to find ways to bring new businesses that are into Woodstock, but also support the small businesses that are here because it is kind of the lifeblood of, of the town. And you've got to find a way to, to both kind of uh, uh, cement your ability to do business here, but also to attract new business as well. And I think being able to kind of get that, um, that mix of how do we support the businesses that have been here for a long time, who are in so many ways kind of the institutional memory of the town, and also find ways to bring things in, in that are exciting to residents, uh, new and, and long time residents alike. So I think those are going to be some challenges as you look forward to sort of the next five, ten years about what, how do we attract that business mix and new residents. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so we're going to move on to the in the agenda to the report of the structural evaluation of the town hall. Um, so Kate is here from the engineering service, who I might add publicly, I think did an excellent job, a very thorough job of this report, and I'm very pleased with it. I don't know how to get rid of please clean the filters. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that. But we can have that as a temple action. Hit the enter button. Okay. Uh, left back side. Oh. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. Yes, so I'm Katie Hill. I'm a structural engineer with Sellers Tribal Structural Engineers out of Richmond. And um, several months ago, we were asked to do a structural evaluation of the town hall building primarily focusing on the large settlements that have occurred at the back of the building. Um, I did send a report to Jill last week. It was quite detailed, a lot of pages there, more, much more than I would normally do in an evaluation report. Um, but one of the things about this building is there have been settlement problems since the day it was built and large settlements. And I just can imagine 30 years from now when the memory of this meeting has faded, someone's going to look at the building and say, oh my goodness, this thing has settled so much, we should have someone take a look at this. <laughs> and at that point, having a really well-documented record of the state of the building right now, where the settlement is now, where the cracking is, you know, whether it's an issue or not, and what we think we ought to do about it, it will be really invaluable in the future. So I apologize for the many pages you had to read, but there was a reason for doing that in this particular case. Um, <coughs> yes. Do you want to just explain to folks what settlement means? Just maybe. Sure. Not. Um, Can we let, go ahead with your. Yeah, I was actually just going to say. Ahead. We'll, we'll get to this. We'll get to there. But yeah. if, if there's anything you don't understand that I'm saying or you have a question, please interrupt me as, as we go along. Um, this is. Okay. So just to orient you, for those of you who haven't spent much time staring at the back of the building. So, oops. so this is the west side of the building along the driveway, and this is what I would call the original part of the building built 1899 as the, an opera house originally. <coughs> as you go further back down the driveway, you get to the back of the building, so that's the end of the original building, and then in 1927, the building burned. They did a major reconstruction of it. And at the same time, they constructed <coughs> the stage edition here at the back. And it's, the stage edition is, is the focus of what we're talking about today. And then you can also see along this side of the building, you know, it's quite flat up along the green. The driveway slopes gently down along the length of the building till you get to the back. And you can't see it because of the snow pile, but then it drops off very quickly as you could take the driveway <coughs> down to the, where the parking lot is at the, the lower terrace along the river. Okay, looking at the back of the building, so this is the back of the stage edition, and you can see the driveway suddenly getting much steeper down to the back of the building, or to the, the parking lot. And I just want to point out that there's a whole lot of stuff at the back of the building. We've got mechanical equipment, air conditioners, we've got a couple of utility poles, buried electric lines, a fuel tank here, gas line. We have uh, an egress stair that serves the whole building that exits right here. It has a walkway around the building. So the question everyone's been saying is, well, do we need to do something to reinforce the foundations? Well, if you do want to reinforce the foundations, all that stuff has to come out to get to the foundations because they're located about 10, 10 11 feet below grade. So any effort to try to go in and underpin the building, just keep in mind, it involves a major disruption to everything in the building. I don't know if you can continue to occupy the building with all this, this safety exits closed off. So it's just something to keep in mind. Is, is, the, yes. is the chimney on the original building or the theater? The, the, the chimney is on the very back corner of the addition. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, whoops, I wanted something here. So, yeah, 
So this is a close-up of on the west side of the building. So here's the back of the original building, and here's the addition. And just a few things that I wanted to point out. So the stage doors are located right here. So this is the stage level. There's a stairway not shown that comes down to the outside. This is your driveway. And you can see the foundations of the building are good 10, 11 feet down below where the driveway is right now. That's the door into the boiler room. You go down some steep stairs, and the boiler room is actually located at this much lower level. Um, there's a concrete buttress here. So they had a lot of problems with the original building. Before they built the addition, there was a major round of upgrades of the foundations of the original building that you can see if you go down in the basement. They also added these concrete buttresses onto the back of the building. I'm not quite sure what they were trying to accomplish, but there was some sort of problem. And they did that to try to stabilize it. And then the addition <coughs> was built up on top of that. If you step through those doors into the building, here's a cross section through it. Here's your stage level with the proscenium opening out to the, the seats. Got a roof. About 35 feet about above the stage is a wood framing loft um, where they hang like the scenery and the curtains and stuff like that. And here's the boiler room that's down low, again, several feet below the existing grade. And you can see how they had reinforced the foundations of the back wall of the original building. Um, we did some probing to figure out where the foundations were. And this is where we found that they were. And from the space underneath the, the seats, you can see these foundations. And it seems like everything is at about the same level, at about this point down here, which I think is about equal to where the parking lot is right now at the lower terrace. I don't have an actual survey, but I think it's at about that same point. Okay. All right, so the reason that we're here is that there is a huge gaping crack that has opened up between the addition and the original building. And it starts very small about here, gets to about an inch wide horizontally here. It's three inches wide up at the top of the building. I mean, just gaping. You can't see it on the outside of the building because there's a steel angle that covers it. But on the inside of the building, there's a great big cap gap there and some insulation and stuff in it. Um, this is true on both sides of the building. Um, there are some other cracks, there's some around the openings, it's very common when you have differential, any sort of settlement, you get these diagonal cracks that happen <coughs> near openings. Um, and there's a little bit of cracking occurring that's still open at the back of the original building. Um, what's my place in here? So, so do you mean the original building is still settling? Yes, we're going to come to that in just a second. Let me find where I am on here. Um, out of order here. Okay, yeah, all right, sorry, so we've got the cracks. Aside from these big cracks that sort of run all along here, and a few cracks around the doors, the addition itself actually is in very good shape. There's very little cracking, there's a little bit that's been patched, but it's in it, it good solid structural condition, all the wall, three walls are stitched together. So that part is sound, it's just the, the cracking is all happening at the <coughs> separation here between the two buildings. If you look at the original building, you stand on the sidewalk and you sight towards the back of the building, you look at the coursing, the building is dropping off towards the back. It's settling several inches. These should all be nice straight lines going off into the distance and they're all out of skew with each other and there's differential settlement along the side. And I spent some time walking through the whole building and you can see this all over the outside of the building. There's lots and lots of cracking on the outside of the building, typical these diagonal cracks that happen around windows. Sometimes they cross through here. This was actually a window opening they got filled in. But there's a lot of patching work that's been done on the building. But the good news is it's all been patched. And it has no, it looks like it's been patched a long time ago, but it hasn't opened again since. Um, so it seems like the set, whatever settlement's been happening at the original building is pretty much stopped at this point. And even the settlement cracks that I saw, none of it is really of structural significance. I mean, the settlement, settlement, which is back to your question, is. Imagine this is your building. You build it on dirt, and the dirt underneath it compresses, so it starts to sink down. Sometimes, in the case of this building, it starts to rotate as it sinks. So given the magnitude of the settlements that I was seeing, I recommended to the town that the town hire a surveyor to professionally 
measure how much it had settled along the length of the building so we could understand better what was going on. So there's a lot of information on here, but the, the little red dots are the points that were surveyed and they got the vertical elevation. So from the front of the building, front of the original building, to the back of the original building, it settled seven inches at the back compared to the front. That's a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, the amount of cracking is not that much for a building that has settled that much. So what's really happened is this building has, you know, settled, but it's settled as a whole. So it's caused a little bit of cracking, but it's pretty much just settled as a unit. We surveyed the back wall of the building right here, and it's three inches further out at the top and at the bottom. So again, that's the building rotating like this. And the <coughs> <coughs> um, we did a similar exercise over here, so we followed a single brick course all the way across, and from here to here, it settled three inches more at the back of the building, back of the addition, and at the front of the addition. I also surveyed the back wall, it was three inches out of the bottom. We also looked at the back of the building, and what we found is there was no difference in settlement here versus here. So all the settlement is happening from front to back of the building. It's not really anything happening side to side. The other thing we had the surveyor do is we had him put a couple of permanent survey markers up at the top of the building. And he did record um, the elevations, three-dimensional locations of those points. So if you want to go back in three years or five years or 20 years, you can go back and survey it again and see how if anything has changed in three dimensions, at, but only at those two points that you can compare to over time. So basically what's been happening is we started with this original building that was built. It was on soft soil that varied under, along the length of the building. So it settled more at one end, probably a little bit at the front, but a whole lot at the back. They came in in 1929 or so, they built the addition. The way that the addition starts to make the soil settle, except it got caught on the existing foundations there, sitting on top of that buttress. So the buttress didn't settle, the back continued to settle, and as a result, that back bit is rotating out away from the building. So that's what I see looking at the building. Um, then we had some soil borings done to see what's happening underneath the building. So this is a site plan. So here's the road, here's the parking lot, here's the original building, there's the addition. So we did three borings. One was in, all in the driveway. So one is here at the back wall of the addition. One is here at the back wall of the original building, so by the buttress, and then one is kind of about in the middle of the original building. And we were expecting to find fill under this building that would explain why it's been settling like this. And that's not what we found. So here's the picture I showed you earlier. And these are the three borings. This one here is actually located about here, but I ran out of page, so it's drawn right there. And the different colors represent the different types of soils beneath, beneath the building. So the red layer is filled. It's just like loose sand, soil. There's construction debris, bricks, ash, all that kind of stuff. And you'll see that it stops just about at where the bottoms of the footings are. So that when they built the building, they dug all the way through all that stuff and got down to the native soil, which is this green material here, which is a silty fine sand. You find it in river valleys all over Vermont. It settles a fair amount. But it generally settled, most of the settlement generally happens right at the beginning in the first year or so. You shouldn't have long-term settlement <coughs> material. The boring we were most interested in, fortunately, had refusal just past that silty layer. We got into a layer of gravel, and there were probably some stones in it, and it jammed up and couldn't go any further. So we had to abandon that one. Um, the next one over, we did find a couple of feet of gravel. And then we got into this very, very soft, silty clay layer. Um, and the thing about clay that's significant is that's what gives you long-term settlement. And when we got down to about 25 feet, there was a layer that was very, very loose. So that basically, when they do the, the borings, they, they drop a hammer um, to see how many times you have to hit it before it goes six inches. And basically, one hammer hit was enough to just send it all the way through the soil. So there's a very, very soft layer under the building. And usually, once you get down that far below a building, it doesn't have that much impact because the weight of the building spreads out so much by the time it gets there, it doesn't make that much difference. But in this case, you know, we had seven inches of settlement. Um, <laughs> and so the geotechnical engineer had done some predictions of what the settlement should be back here, and he was getting on the order of one to two inches, and we're seeing three inches plus in the building, so there's clearly something else going on. 
So the two things we think are at play here is we have this very soft layer, we don't know a whole lot about it, we don't know how deep it goes, because we right at the bottom of the boring is where it got really soft. And the other issue is when we started looking at the building is we concluded there's an awful lot of fill that's been added around this building from the original construction. <coughs> I think that the likely original grade of his parking lots back here, whoops, sorry, was along here, and somewhere about halfway up the building is when it finally slopes up to where the road is. So that whole driveway there, it's all backfill, where the stair is on the back of the building, that's backfill, all that stuff at the behind the building where all the mechanical equipment, all that's backfill. Dirt is heavy. All that dirt that's been added over the years probably weighs more than the building does in that area. And because it's spread out over such a large area, it gets down into that really soft layer down here. So I think that's fundamentally the problem. We have the building plus a whole lot of fill that's been added around it, and that's affecting this very soft layer down low. Um, going back to the, uh, the track monitors, that's back a couple pages here. So this gaping crack here, when we explored the building, we found a couple of crack monitors, four of them. They look about like that. And there's one at nine feet above stage level and one up in the loft, and then the same thing on the other side of the building. And what we found was, while the, the gap was three inches wide, the crack monitor was only showing one inch of movement. The problem is, we don't know when the crack monitors were installed. It's likely when the building was rent, there's a major renovation in the late 1980s, about 30 years ago, that would be a reasonable time to have put them in. Um, they looked up that vintage. I spoke to the engineer who had worked on the building at that time. He said he remembered the crack. Putting in, in the crack monitors was something their firm did. They likely did it. He didn't happen to remember doing it, but it's very likely it was installed then. So we've got three inches of movement since the building was built 90 years ago. One third of that's happened over the last 30 years. That would seem to imply that this is going at a continuous rate, except what I think happened is as part of that renovation, I believe that's when they added a lot of the fill around the building. So all that movement we've seen in that crack monitor in the 30 years, I think probably happened shortly after all that fill was added. I don't think that's an ongoing thing. So because of that, I think the settlements have probably tapered off at the back of the building, but there's really no way to know. Because unlike the the original part of the building where I can read the building and see nothing's happened in a long time, there's no, no hints on the addition that allow me to say that with any confidence that it's not still moving. Although I think it's probably likely it's not at that point. Um, so what do you do? I mean, the big issue is, is it going to continue to settle? And how much is it going to continue to settle? What impact does that have on planning for the building? I think the best way to make any sort of prediction is to monitor the building. I mean, we could go back and do some more geotechnical evaluation, but without another boring at the back of the building going deeper, and without a lot of legwork trying to figure out how much fill is there and when it was installed, it, we can't really predict accurately by analysis. The best way is to just look at the building. Um, time frame, I would say three to five years. And you know, if you look at it for a year or two and nothing happens, well, if you look at it for a year or two and you're seeing something happening, that's an answer. If nothing happens, you probably want to wait about three years to convince yourself that nothing's happening. Um, and I would suggest doing that monitoring before you make any big plans for should you fix the foundation, should you put an addition on the back of the building, should you put a lot of investment into the stage addition. Because I think you want to get an answer to that. Um, in terms of how to go about the monitoring, I did in the back of a report, I gave uh, quite a bit of detail on how to do that. And it basically boils down to a couple of things. Get four more of these things that are less than 20 bucks a piece. <coughs> Stick them in the four right next to the existing monitors. Because we know what date, and you write, literally write on it, what day you installed it so 30 years from now somebody can see that. <laughs> um, and start monitoring that. Um, the cracks on the addition that are open right now, get those patched with the cementitious material because that's really brittle. If there's any more movement, it'll crack open again and you, all you have to do is measure the size of the crack to know how much it's open. Um, up in the, the, the roof and the lo loft level, there are some steel beams, which I'll come back to in just a minute. I suggest painting the ends of those beams where they go into the brick. That way, if there's any relative movement between beam and brick, you can see it. And then, you know, three or five years time, you come back and survey those two permanent markers again. 
And you should be able to get a sense there, is it still moving, and at what rate it's still moving. And I so strongly suspect you're going to find it's probably tapered off to close to nothing at this point. But again, there's no way to know without spending some time monitoring. Um, one note on the crack monitors up in the loft. The loft doesn't run, actually, I have my little picture, my little model of the building. So here's the original building. Here's the addition. Oops, sorry. That little triangle is the buttress that's there. So if you open it up, we've got the stage level at the loft. The loft doesn't come all the way out to the exterior wall. I'm not sure why not. And the crack monitor is right here. So in order to install the crack monitor, you're going to need some sort of temporary platform to get over there. And if someone's going to check that monitor every year or so, they're going to want that to be a permanent platform so that they can continue. It's about six feet away, and it's way up high in the air. So you're going to probably want a little platform built right there so that you can do the monitor. Is that like the stage that you're talking about? Yes. Yes. So, so above the rafter. Sorry? Above that. We've got like a catwalk. It's above that. Yep. Yep. You need like just a second catwalk except at the stage side or at the presidium side. All right. The... Uh, okay. So... The thing about the monitoring is that it's relatively inexpensive to do. You can start like next week, and the sooner you get started, the sooner you're going to have an answer of is it still moving or not. So that's an easy thing to get going with. So the real question is, so what are the implications of all of this building movement? Um, because of the way that this has tilted away from the building, at this point, this building, the addition, is, is, is a structurally independent building. It's no longer connected at all to the original building. So there's a gaping crack along the wall. The roof is no longer attached to the roof framing of the original building. The roofing is, has it's been re-roofed since it's, the roofing mm -hmm. continues over the gap, but it's no longer structurally connected together. And so it's its own entity. And it's got a lean. You know, three inches over 40 feet or something like that. But you think Tower of Pisa, that's like several feet. So you're not in danger of the whole thing tipping over. So it's not, as, as long as, as the C shape of the three walls remains held together in the right shape, I mean, you can tip this thing really far before it's going to fall over. So the lean in and of itself is not a problem. The fact that there's this crack and it's not attached to the rest of the building, there are some issues with that. Um, one of the first issues is that because this building has leaned away, we have a series of beams. So there's two steel beams at the roof level and seven, or sorry, nine steel beams in the loft. You can see the black lines in there. And they run from the back wall of the addition to the back wall of the original building, and they're embedded into the brick on both sides. And you can imagine if this has moved three inches away from the other wall, and that beam is connecting the two walls together, something had to give in that system. And so I was concerned initially, I wasn't able to get up at the loft in my first visit, and I was <coughs> concerned that some of those beams may have pulled out of the wall. So we came back, and Ken from the highway department helped me open up some probes, and then we had the town open up a bunch more probes to check all of the beams. And we found that all of the beams in the back wall were sufficiently embedded in the wall, except for one that had started to pull out. Um, that's the one that's closest, closest to the chimney at the end of the building. That one, in the short term, should get a little bracket under the end of the beam just to make sure it's adequately supported. But the others right now are OK. The beams that connect into the back of the original building, they extended quite a bit further into the wall. So I think they've probably moved at this point. There's been some patching around them. But there's enough beam there that it's adequately supported. So right now, all the beams except one are adequately supported. You fix that one, and <coughs> the existing condition it's fine. But it does raise the question, if the building continues to move, that is something that needs to be monitored, and that's why I suggested painting around the edge of the beam where it hits the brick, because if that slips at all, you'll be able to see the gap, and it'll be easy to tell. And Katie, those beams are what's above the stage? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Um, I think I had a picture of that here. So this is so this is the back wall of the addition. This is the back wall of the original building, which is also the presidium. So those are your roof beams, and they're bedded four inches into the back wall. And then your loft beams bedded four inches into the back wall, 
when you step further through this wall. So all of these were sound except for one that had started to pull out. And these have so much bearing that even if it moves three inches, it's not an issue. So that's, that's right now. So is that the only point of the old building connected to the new built and the addition? Well, the, the stage has some connection with the floor joists, but if there's so much, you know, if you take that crack, most of the crack is it's just starting at stage level, so it really hasn't separated very much at the stage level. The problem is really up much higher. Okay. Um, so the implications of this movement. So we talked about the beams. Um, one of the other things is, so as this starts to lean, this back wall here wants to start to bulge out under its own weight. And what's stopping it from doing that is the fact that the roof framing is connected to the top of the wall with anchor bolts every so often, except it's pretty minimally fastened together because normally you don't have buildings that are leaning, so they don't have these forces on it. So I would suggest just reinforcing that connection along there um, where the top of the wall is connected to the framing and actually to do it on all three sides, just to better stitch the three walls of the building together. So and when you do that, then you can accommodate more tilt without any problem. The fact that the side walls now have these, these gaping cracks um, is a problem and it is something I think needs to be addressed because if you've got the wind blowing or an earthquake happening like that, it's pushing on the side of the wall and that wall used to be attached to the other building. And now because it's a free wall, it can really flex and break. And that's a potential, I mean, the building, this building has been tested with wind but not with earthquake. And that's probably the weakest link in the building that if we did have an earthquake, that long unsupported wall could begin to fail and take down some of the roof. I think that's relatively easy to fix by adding some periodic brackets, tying it back to the building so that it can't move out of plane, <coughs> but it still can slide a little bit. So if the building settles a little bit further away, it's not going to get caught up on it, but it will stabilize that edge of the wall. Um, and then the last thing is so for when you load the building this way for, for wind and earthquake loads, some of the load used to be resisted by its connection, by the uh, this wall of the original building. And that's not there anymore. So everything has to be resisted by the outside wall, um, which puts a lot more demands on the roof up here to stitch everything together. So I would recommend strengthening this roof diaphragm. There's a couple ways to do it. If you were taking the roof off, just put some more plywood on top. The roof, the roof looked like it was in pretty good condition. Maybe you could put the plywood on the underside of the joist, maybe some diagonal bracing in there. But with those three things, of improving the connections here, reinforcing the diaphragm, and adding some bracing at the sidewall, then it's perfectly sound as it is, leaning the way it is right now. It should be able to accommodate more settlement, maybe another 50%. You might get a little more cracking here and there that you have to patch, but it's sufficiently solid. It can accommodate a lot of movement. So that means it's really not all that pressing to do anything about the foundations. You certainly have time to monitor the building and see if in fact it's doing anything. There's no rush. Um, I would suggest, because some of these, these deficiencies that I just pointed out, I mean, they are structural deficiencies that, you know, could be potentially serious if you had an earthquake. You know, I don't think you need to just do, to just do anything about it tomorrow, but it's the sort of thing I think within a year's time ought to be addressed. It will take some time to coordinate how, how to do that work. Um, what to do about the foundations. So my recommendation is to watch and wait. I, as I said, I think it's likely the settlements have slowed down at the back of the building. We don't know for sure. We can monitor it for time, and then that's the best way to know for sure. If you're finding that the settlements are, I mean, the building is sound enough with the upgrades that I just talked about. The building's not going like, to fall over or anything like that. The building's sound as it is. Um, and you know, if if you monitor and you find that it is moving, it's moving too much, or the amount of movement is no good with our plans for the building, and I think your absolute last resort is okay, let's underpin the foundations. What does underpin mean? We've got our existing footing here, you come in with something else underneath that to pick that up and resupport it from below. In order to do that, you've got to excavate everything out at the back of the building down to below the footing level. That's 11 feet of stuff and everything behind the building has to go. The driveway, the mechanical equipment, the walkway, the power poles, all that has to come out to do that work. Um, the geotechnical engineer recommended using helical piles. These are, imagine, giant corkscrews. Like 
in diameter like this. And they get drilled with a huge drill that comes in and they come down at an angle like this and they just keep drilling until they get enough resistance in the material below. So sort of like self-test as they go down. And then there's a clamp that you put on the top of it that catches the bottom of the foundation. So every couple of feet, you would put another one of these in. So it would be involved going around all three sides. It's an expensive undertaking. I've done one on a building of similar scale. is probably in the $100,000 range. Um, no, it doesn't include all the removing all the utilities and all that stuff at the back of the building. It's not 100% guaranteed to work. I mean, it probably will help a lot. Um, there are a couple of issues when you take away all that backfill, you're probably going to get some rebound settlement coming back up. You can get some damage from the building to do that. Put the fill back, you'll settle down again. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that if you have to do it, you can do it, but I really would recommend not doing it unless you absolutely have to. Um, so monitor the building, you know, do a couple of structural upgrades so it's stitched better together. Spend your money on some minor structural upgrades rather than spending a couple hundred thousand dollars underpinning the foundation, which I really don't think needs to be done unless you, you see another three inches of settlement. I, I don't think we're gonna see that. Um, other issues for long-term planning of the building. Sounds like you're thinking of maybe doing some things with the building. Um, a couple of recommendations. Don't add any more fill around the building. Fill is heavy, it's just gonna cause more settlement and, and for some distance around the building. So respect the grading that's there. Um, try to avoid putting new heavy long-term loads in the addition. Um, you know, change, putting in some mechanical ducting and changing the finishes, that, that's fine. But like, don't turn it into the storage room for the town files or don't add another floor in it or something like that. So don't add much because any more load you put in the back of the building is going to cause more settling and, and more cracking. Um, if you I've understand the green room is too small, and there's been some talk of, well, maybe do we add out at the back, something out at the back of the building? And I think that's still a possibility. The thing you have to keep in mind is any new addition We've got some really soft soil under this, so the new addition is gonna settle. So any new addition needs to be isolated from the existing building so the new addition can settle without causing damage to the existing building. Um, we do that all the time with additions, not all the time, but reasonably enough. So that's, you may end up having like a, a linking ramp out to it or something like that. Um, the new addition should be kept as light as possible. So you're talking wood framing. You know, you could probably do a single story without too much trouble. I don't know about two stories. Um, you need to respect, respect that grading at the back of the building, which means if you want your new floor to be lined up with the green room, it's going to have to be a frame floor. It needs to be up in the air. You can't bring in fill to turn that into a slab on grade. Um, and if you are planning an addition, I would strongly recommend working with a geotechnical engineer in very, very early stages just to make sure that the scope of what you're planning is going to be reasonable. He may want to do a couple extra borings back there to see underneath the new addition what would be there. Um, so that pretty much wraps up many thoughts I've had on this building. Um, so I mean, it, it looks alarming. You talk about seven inches of settlement, three inches of lean, but it's a well-configured building, and with a few minor modifications, I think it can safely take that over the long term. Joe, so would you thank you? Thank you very much. So, any questions? Very good. Uh, I don't think so. No, it's okay. Thank you. I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure there are, but we, thanks for your report. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to the present to us. So. Well, that's good news. Thank you. Okay. So. There we go. So, we have. So we'll go back to the um, interviews for PC Fiber. I believe Alex has arrived. Yes. You want to come up front and introduce yourself and tell us why you think you uh, want to be on the EC Fiber? Would you like me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, sorry, I was That's all right. running with the dogs and the baby. Yeah, That's oh okay. Um, so thanks for considering me. I uh, moved here last year yeah, to Woodstock 
and um, love the area. My wife and I have loved it for a long time. <coughs> and um, when we moved, there wasn't really any internet available for our house, so I started becoming interested in how that could, what was available, and looking into EC Fiber. That was when I first became aware of it. Um, so I'm, I'm hopefully going to be a customer. I provided them an easement across my property. Um, because where I live, the poles stop on Prosper Road on either road, on either strip to four and to twelve. Um, as a professional interest, I've been looking at fiber and fiber systems now for a number of years. Uh, everything from towers to uh, fiber to the home, fiber to the premises, um, residential uh, residential systems, business systems, municipalities. I'm familiar with a lot of what states are doing, um, whether they're having open systems or whether they're having uh, individual companies bid on, on projects. Um, I've seen a lot of different models. Uh, I'm particularly fascinated with what EC Fiber has been able to accomplish in a relatively short amount of time. Um, the per home pass cost is like nothing I've seen in the entire country. Uh, $30,000 a mile, six, average six homes, $5,000 per home pass. That is probably twice what the cost is of any residential fiber of the premises project that I've seen from Nebraska to Seattle, Florida. I'm sure there are ones out there that are like it. And I think what the most amazing thing is, is that EC Fiber is profitable and that they were able to do it on a community basis and raise, I think it was like seven and a half million dollars was the first bond issue at 8%, something like $2,500 bonds uh, door to door. And that wasn't even Vermont guaranteed. Um, and the community came together and they did it. And that was Barnard and 23 member towns. and. 550 miles later and 3,500 customers going on 5,000 this year. And uh, it's just a remarkable story. And um, I think it's one that deserves a lot of study and that's why I've paid attention to it. And I've gone to, uh, I reached out through some people that I knew in town to um, uh, eventually find David Brown. And he was kind enough to sit down with me on a Saturday over at the Woodstock Inn and kind of give me the whole story of his involvement with the project and Woodstock's involvement. and. Um, uh, and then invited me to come to a couple of meetings. So I went to uh, a couple of the meetings up at the Vermont Law School, Law School, enjoyed listening and taking notes and just hearing what was going on. And um, so I, I met, um, so I, I like that pizza place where I met Dave before the meetings. <laughs> He's nice enough to give me a ride up there, so. Um, so you'll go again to the pizza place? Yeah, that pizza <laughs> place is great, yeah, because it's a long meeting, so <laughs> kind of hungry after a while. Uh, and uh, it was just great. I just think it's a really, um, you know, I, I finally got the call like last week that they're going to come and do the drop next Friday, <laughs> so that's like Christmas. Now or I, I understand the importance of the utility of that, having that device and that access. I mean, I think it's a lot like electricity was about 100 years ago. And when you actually bring that to businesses and to homes, it's a huge game changer because that's how commerce is done. I mean, as a, as a matter of me being able to move to Woodstock was a function of being able to have that. Otherwise, I wouldn't, able to, wouldn't have been able to do it. And we would have just kept driving by Woodstock and getting our food at the farmer's market and you know, going to visit the family in Lake George, and that's what we did for years and years. And um, the fact that we could have this at our home is, uh, you know, means we can work here and I can raise my kids here, and um, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the business model is fascinating. I think the fact that, uh, I think all the things that Vermont, I can keep going, I don't know about the, what Vermont's <laughs> done and changed the law on the make ready on the polls is fascinating. That's a huge opportunity nationwide. Um, you know, and, and I got, again, I talked to a lot of companies, municipalities, Colorado's going through a fascinating, I'm from Boulder, Colorado originally, I was born there, and Colorado's got a really interesting process going on right now where they're um, allowing for open, open models similar to the one that had been kind of pioneered here in Vermont, and I've heard, um, you know, a lot of people talking about whether this model's better or that model's better, and so having something like this to look at. And, you know, share with other communities. I think it's really interesting. Uh, so bottom line, I would love to participate, to be a good uh, neighbor and citizen. And if there's something I can do to help push to improve or help or move things forward, I'm happy to do it. Um, and have you met Dan? I haven't met Dan. Hey, Dan, nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, I, saw, I saw your name. I thought you were on the committee. I, I saw your name from previous minutes. Oh, no. All right. 
I saw that name and I was like, I thought that looks familiar from like the main minutes or something. Um, no questions. But happy to answer any questions, guys. Questions? I don't know. No, I'm grateful that you're going to serve. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. And we can have two alternates, right? We, we can have the first alternate in the second. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot. Um, Sorry, Mr. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to executive session after for the appointments. All right, we can do okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Economic Development Commission. Your monthly uh, update. Come on down, John. Hi. Uh, we have one motion to propose and a quick update. The motion is to approve uh, a 30% reduction in administered support costs from 50K last year to 35K uh, for this uh, fiscal year begin ending J June 30th. We intend to use that 35K <laughs> 25000 for a program manager and 10000 for administ administrator and administrative support costs. I think you're all familiar with that plan. We haven't implemented it yet. We're still moving ahead with one person, but we think this budget will cover us for the year in both, both models because we've had a reduction in the number of hours. So, so that's, I'll just leave it at, now at that. Now that's 35 total, including, is, is what we approved for the two months. Correct. It's early. included. It's included. It's in included. That. Those Thank two you. months are included. Thank you. Happy to answer any. Any questions from anybody? No. We'll never let him off this easy, are we? Oh, well. Because yeah. he was no question. How many hours do you have for the uh, administrative yeah. expenses? You have ten, what's we have a dollar amount, but you don't have. Right. We have. So we. This is for 12 hours for the program manager. And I don't, is that Sally still here? Yes. yes. I can't, I might have a neck problem. Do you remember how many hours it is for the? Five, I don't know, maybe 20 hours a month, I think it was. Yeah. At, at a, and that would be at a lower cost. And we ha have been advised, we know that, that th these are not, um, we, have, we have not yet put together the precise job description for these two jobs because we still haven't started the hiring process. But we, but we believe that the processes can be simplified to some extent, that a fair bit of the administrative time, I've talked to Sally about this, in the first year was spent on setting up the processes as opposed to administering them. Now, I know that there's some of you, I mean, Mary has expressed a concern that we be very careful about this, that we make sure that we have enough time for the administrative support. Um, and uh, to be honest, I, we're, th this will, f if we need more time we make and more money, we may come back and ask you for it. Uh, so I'm not ready yet to ask for more, but we will take the caution, Mary, that you've said. When we write out the job description, when we start the search for this person and for people and finalize it, you know, it's possible that we'll come back for more. This will, under the current model, this will continue to work. It's worked for the first two and a half months. It will continue to work. If we, in the worst case, I mean, if we had to go through the year, this would support us. So Sally will remain in the program management part of it? Well, we, we, I mean, officially we haven't selected it. We yeah. would hope she would. We've talked to her about that. That's okay. our plan. So that's your plan? Yeah. Okay. Is that, I mean, am I? Am I or yeah. someone it would it's do that? With some, yeah, I mean, someone program similar, but I mean. management <coughs> is, how many hours a week is you allowing? For in this? model we're allowing for 12. 12 for the program management right. and 20 a month for let's say five 12 per week for program management and let's say five to seven let's say for administration there's a little bit of wiggle room here because there's also a few this this ten thousand dollars is a combination of staff cost and very modest cost for things like you know like we had the picnic last mm -hmm. week which the edc funded a little bit because it was part of the visioning project I mean, we didn't fund the whole picnic. We contributed a few hundred dollars or something like and that. Sally had her hand up, so I think yeah. she wanted to yeah, add please. something. So the only thing I would say is that I said 20 hours a month. That's because um, in the administrative position, it, it, it doesn't co come easily into five hours a week. Right. So ideally, we would have somebody that would do the minutes for the meetings and right. do the, that sort of work, and that tends to be, you know, that's one correct. week it may be 10, and the next week it may be two. Kind right, of. yes. I, I meant an average. 
So what do you need from us? To I think an approval, I think you, this is like us coming to you with approval for spending money for the lights on the town green. It's a, it's an EDC project in effect and you approve all the EDC spending. 35,000. So we're asking you to approve 35,000 for this fiscal year. You've already approved the first two months of that. Well, what do we approve for the first two months? Oh, uh, <coughs> I, uh, I, uh, I don't. Um, what about one sixth of it? Uh, no, no, it wasn't that. It was, it was slightly. It might have, it might have been slightly well, different. I, I had actually suggested that you ask for the thirty-five for for the full year, right? Because there may be, for instance, right. I'm still doing because we <coughs> don't have somebody doing the administrative work. I'm still doing that, yeah. so I'm actually working more than twelve hours per week. So that I would hope that you would just approve the thirty-five, yeah. and we'll hopefully I'm not spend it all this no. year. Are we, doing, are we backdating it to the last two months? We're starting one. fresh. Well, no. We're just, we just going to approve an allocation of thirty-five thousand, right, not an expenditure of thirty-five thousand. From when? From, from July one to June thirtieth, to yeah. include what so had been previously approved and expenditure. Okay. No. So we're extending so the time. Frame. No. No. See no. that what we approved before. Right. It's already been approved. That's done. I'm asking. I, I suggested that you approve another thirty-five thousand. Another. However. I mean, I, I have been working on extensions here, and I will mm -hmm. continue to work. I don't expect that you will, the EDC will need all that 35000 It's just sort of to cover. That's if we had done it from John, July 1st to June 30th, it would have been 35000 So in theory, you could take out, the, I think it was 6000 for this amount. But, but in reality, I mean, just to get it in the budget, and then it stays the same for yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. I misunderstood Sally. Yeah, I misunderstood. I'm sure she explained it clearly. Okay. <laughs> Everybody. Um, I'd rather go into executive session on oh. this. All right. Okay. Oh, Withdraw. <laughs> can we have Jonathan uh, join us in that executive session who? to explain? Can we have Jonathan join yes. us to explain? Yes. Okay. 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 So. Immediately following this meeting, we're going to executive session for a couple of things. <laughs> Appointments and the EDC. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I just have very quick updates. Um, three things. First is last week we met, some of you met, well, were there, we met to discuss the uh, priorities for physical amenities. Forty people showed up. There were uh, physical amenities is one of our four priorities, the others being marketing, Woodstock, expanding housing, enhancing the business environment. Uh, the five that came out on top were Teagle's Landing, renovate, renovating the town green, the River Loop Trail, all three are relatively big projects, uh, improving the trash cans and improving the info kiosk on the green, which are relatively small projects. Um, we will take that into account very strongly as we put our plan together for calendar year 2020, which we're going to present to you in January or December. Um, I will note that if we were to do all five of those projects fully, it would exceed the EDC's funding without regard to any money we would spend on marketing or housing or anything else. <coughs> so we're not going to be able to simply follow the vote and do those projects because we don't have the money to do them. So we're going to have to stage it and think about the legality and the practice of you know, affordability and so forth. Um, the second point is and, uh, we would like to, mo we plan to modify the process that we use um, it to uh, consider community grants. Um, not the part about coming to you for approval, but the timing and the sequence of things. Now, I, I don't know whether it was, I think, Ray, you would ask Larry whether, or somebody, whether this had to be approved by the select board. We're bringing it to you so you can be aware of it. If you have to approve it, then we would ask you to approve it. But I don't think you approved the prior processes that we use. So I don't know whether you need to approve this or not. But we would, here's what we would like to do. We would like to uh, divide our proposals that we, that we fund, whether they are EDC projects or community projects. <laughs> Anything greater than $5,000, we would like to consider once per year. We'd like to do that at an annual planning meeting that'll be open to the public and will solicit a lot of public input in December. Uh, and all of, those, all of those large projects would, whether they're EDC projects or community projects, would require the same level of documentation, of legal checking, of review with the de design review board or the development review board or the conservation commission or whomever is required, all of the above. In the case of Teagle's Landing, I think it's all of the above. Um, 
and uh, we would monitor those throughout the year. We'd have, it would be a much more formal process to make sure that the projects we undertake don't run into operational problems, they don't run into legal issues, you know, as we've seen before. Um, we would then take small projects, and there would be no large projects greater than 5K in any non-priority areas. The only thing we would award more than 5K for would be uh, physical amenities, uh, housing, marketing Woodstock, or supporting the business environment. If it's something other than that, we're not going to grant a lot of money to it. For smaller projects, which hopefully would be in those priority areas, but might not be, we would uh, start considering those projects in December. We would, we would set an annual limit on the amount of those projects. Maybe it's $50,000 a year. We would start considering them in, de in December, and we would keep considering them every two months until the money ran out, which is, again, right now we do it every four months, but we, we, we do it three times a year, but we don't have a, a limit on the funding and we don't have a focus on the priority. So what we're trying to do is to limit the amount of time that we do picking projects, get more community input at an <coughs> annual meeting, a big annual meeting, do it before you all set your budget so that we can come to the select board in January and say, here's almost all of our budget for 2020. <laughs> We've done all the big projects. We've done a few. We've started doing the community projects. Maybe we've used up all the money in December for, for small projects. Maybe we have a little bit left. But we can give you a real picture. And then for the rest of the year, you'll you can approve it. And then for the rest of the year, we'll just focus on executing those projects well. And then we'll repeat the cycle. So at the year. beginning of the year, um, we, you will know what you're going to allow for those small projects. We will the know the amount, year, right? The total, amount. correct? Mm -hmm. And we'll have a percentage. I don't know. We're going to no, just, no, just uh, no. we'll no. It would probably be a percentage. So the amount would um, I don't know. Okay. And I, that I will know. be at an open meeting. Correct. And, uh, right. And so we would we would come to you if we had that open meeting. It would be like our version of town meeting in December. We would then come to you, because you have to approve our spending, in January and say, here's the projects that the EDC is proposing to fund. Here are the projects that the community has proposed. Here's the amount of the budget we want to set aside for community projects. And by the way, some of that has already been proposed. Um, this has been voted, you know, we, we got the following feedback at the, at the meeting in December. We've taken that into account. Here's our plan for 2020. <clears throat> and you would get that, we hope, in January, in time for you to consider whatever impact that would have on your budget. And then we would, for the rest of the year, for the most part, we wouldn't be considering too many projects, mm -hmm. maybe a few small projects if we had some money left. Well, you see, um, one thing that our budget has to be pretty well set in J by January, right. in January, with the signing of the warning for town meeting, which happens before the end of January, our budget is in place. Right. So let me suggest that, for the, that first of all, this is a one-year test. We would evaluate this again next year to see if we wanted to continue it. One of the things we could easily do next year, we can't do it this year, just, we just don't have enough time, is we could move that up by two months. So okay. if, so, but I think this, first of all, I don't think it will have a major effect on your budget. Probably. But certainly, there's, wouldn't, as long as we can prepare for it in advance, I'd be very happy to, to move it up by two months so that we have our town meeting in right, October and November. a couple weeks. Yeah, whatever it is, whatever, okay. we, we would work it out next year. This year, we're gonna struggle to have a big meeting in December mm -hmm. with everything <coughs> ready. We already know that. We think it might, it might be January. Will that be a regular um, December EDC it, it might, meeting? It might be, because it's going to be longer than usual. We're trying to look at availability. So it might be at the regular December meeting. It might be in early January. We're, not, it's, okay. we're discussing it. So that's the change that we, we'd like to make. Any other questions for John? John, okay. so as we previously discussed, you won't be here next month. You won't be here until... What meeting? In, next? Well, what we talked about is every quarter. Every so, quarter. So I guess December. Which yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that sounds like a good idea. Then you, there's more attention on execution. Right. Yeah. That's and, and community input. Yeah. It, it's, the community input's more focused at one big meeting rather than these obscure meetings that take place. Yeah. When people. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question, John. I'm just a little confused. You said greater than five k. It would be that once a year decision. Yes. Right. Well, less than 5K, what does that fall under? Is that part of the potentially the 50,000? Yeah, that is the, yes, that, that is the 50,000. But what if it's a 7, 7K? Then it would be, it'd fall in once a year. 
So, if so, so, so someone who has a project coming to you in, say, February 1st, and it's $6,500, you say, sorry, we can't even consider this until December. Correct, the way the town <coughs> does in their annual budget, right. But we I think that's a terrible idea in terms of your, your flexibility. Right now, you have the ability every uh, quarter, right. I believe, to consider such projects. Right. I think that that's maybe too small a figure, 5K, or you know, it's too long a time period to consider that. Right. I understand the 50,000 you're, do you're donating. Uh, by the way, that number hasn't been set. I, know, right, 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 right. I understand that. Yeah. Say 60,000, say it's 40,000, whatever the number is. Right. I think you should consider more flexibility in terms of how much, depending on what right. project comes up to you, right. rather than saying, Five K. Well, we did. At, at, this must have been the only meeting that you you weren't at. Uh, I mean, because you're very religiously attend and provide excellent input. But this is exactly the discussion that we had at the last DDC meeting, um, and there was a debate whether it should be five or ten, and it, we were split actually, but it was a close decision. I think the reason why we're setting the limit low is because we really want to focus on a smaller number of larger projects that are in our priority areas. We don't get a lot of projects. You know, we have a big marketing budget. We don't get a lot of projects in marketing. We don't get a lot of projects in housing. And so we really want to focus on fewer, bigger projects. And well, but why not allow um, exceptions if it's still under your limit of money to be spent, if it's close but a bit more uh, than that? So uh, apologies. Stick flexibility. There, there was that we did, uh, I'm sorry, I'm leaving out. We did say that with a two-thirds vote of the EDC, we could make an exception to that policy. Thank you for I maybe that was maybe you were there and you're just reminding me. No, <laughs> I was not. So. Beth. I just you are spending twenty five thousand dollars this year on marketing. Correct? Correct. Well more than that. Yeah. Well I mean that's that's not just a website, website. that's right. just on the commercials. Right. Correct. And so so, and I thought the commercials were kind of a pilot to see if they were, that you would consider them, but now it's gonna be a year and a half before they can be yeah, no, okay. considered so, again. No, well, it wouldn't be a year and a half. It would, we would just, or almost no, no. two years. Well, it depends. I'm, we'll have to see what the results are. The timing, when I say December, the timing of this, it might be January, and that in fact might influence. We might need to push it back into January. We're gonna start getting results on the TV program, well, as you know, <laughs> starting immediately. Yeah. So, it, so I don't think, I think we would adjust this schedule by a few weeks if the TV program, if we have data that suggests the TV program is successful and that we wanted to spend money and had the money to spend in a bigger way in 2020 on it, I don't think we would let the schedule mean we'd have to delay for a year. I think we'd move the schedule by a couple of weeks to or adju a adjust that or we'd have the two-thirds vote, yeah. So, so that's a good point. I, we didn't think of that one, that one particular project that does have a follow-on. Could have, could have a follow-on. Sorry to take so much time here. But. That's okay. So I don't know if you officially have to approve this or not. But We're going to go into executive oh. session afterwards, right? Yeah. Okay. Talk about it all okay. then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We, we, I don't, but to your question, I don't believe we have to approve anything except money. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, moving on in the agenda, old business. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, speak up, sir. Uh, Michael wanted me to suggest that uh, we wouldn't be discussing SDRs tonight because the ordinance process is working its way through, and you're probably going to see that again in, in December. Unless anybody really wants to talk about SDRs. Okay. Sound good? All right. Any other old business? Um, do we want to make a bit of an update on the town hall rejuvenation since we've heard that? What I our next step is? I think it was pretty, yeah, what do you mean? Right, so um, <coughs> our, we've had a team working on the town hall rejuvenation for about a year and we've looked at all sorts of things and we've been on hiatus for the last six months because of this structural engineering report. Now that it's done, we're going to get together again on October the 1st at 6 o'clock and have another meeting about where we go next. Um, 
we have an architect coming to attend that meeting with us and we might think we will be thinking about how we can use this building in the future and we're not talking about something that's going to happen in the next six months we're talking about building a plan for the next five five ten years you heard tonight we're probably not going to do anything for a couple of years as we watch and see what happens so i just wanted to invite everybody to that meeting which is just a di just a discussion for idea so what was the date Jill? october the first at six o'clock okay thank you anything else from the board on all business if not we'll move on to new business and we took care of that the first yeah. item yeah that's been taken care of and request to reduce the speed limit on college hill uh, we have a letter in your packet and would you like to uh, tell us about your letter well, I like to think of it as making the speed limit on College Hill Road consistent. Parts of it are 25 miles an hour, a relatively short part. Parts of it, more of it, is 35 miles an hour. It's a beautiful road for walking. Uh, I began doing that in great seriousness about a month after our house was finished. Um, and my husband had a ski accident. And we have a dog, and our dog likes to walk. And so I am walking a great deal. I met Ray's wife first on, it seems to me, and their dog. I know all the dogs by name. I know Woofy, who's, I'll call him parents, are behind <coughs> Um It's an absolutely beautiful road. It is very well traveled by pedestrians, by walkers like me with a dog, like walkers like people from the village that I know who come up and do a three mile loop uh, in a group or two, and um, you do it for exercise. It's a bicycle path. Um, there are two bicycle signs, bicycle path signs on Route 4, directing people to College Hill Road. Um, and I see bicycles, from time to time I see tourist groups coming through, saying, oh, what a lovely sight. By and large, it's a single biker, um, I must admit. I think the, the, um, the road itself, is a bit hilly. Well, it has rises and dips and curves. It's just a lovely sheltering tree kind of road. There are probably some spots where it's difficult to see uh, for a car, particularly a car coming out of a driveway or a car coming down the road trying to see the pedestrian coming up the road. The road is wide enough for two cars, but if there's a pedestrian nearby, one car always stops. I think the signage is really difficult. Um, where the marker is for the village, it says 25 miles an hour as you're going down into the village. Uphill from that, at the intersection of Shirtliff Lane, if you stand there, you see one sign for 25 miles an hour, one for 35 miles an hour, and another one for 35 miles an hour. A little farther along, you see a sign for blind person area. I think that's something the VA asked the town to put up. And there's another sign coming the other way. At the other end of the, of the uh, road, the signage is even stranger. <laughs> you come off of Metal Bridge, and you're going to turn left onto College Hill Road. It says 35 miles an hour. You make a turn right away. It says slow dangerous curve ahead. And then it says, blind driveways. So here I am at 35 miles an hour and suddenly I'm told to go slowly and watch out for the blind driveways. Um, I just think the signage is inconsistent. I'm glad I thank you for accepting this comment and suggestion and letting it be a part of the select board meeting. And I would as I say, suggest that the road be made a consistent 25 miles an hour. For a short time, the police put a 25 mile an hour sign on the road, I think just to see what it might mean. The solar panel didn't work for whatever reason, so there's no recorded data. But the sign happened to be essentially at the bottom of my driveway. And so I could see it when I was having coffee or tea or whatever. Uh, I have a lot of windows that look out onto the driveway. And by and large, people go slowly, but I was surprised 
at the number of cars that would slow visibly. I just hadn't expected it. Uh, when I'm walking, sometimes I see fast cars. When I started walking early on, one of my good friends from the center of the village told me to be really wary of one particular car because it tended to go fast and ignore the fact that there was a pedestrian nearby. And I thought that was a bit shocking, and I haven't noticed that more than a couple times. But I was surprised to see people slow down. I mean, it's clearly a lovely country road. It's a beautiful walk. When I lived here before, I was on Rose Hill. This one is less hilly than Rose Hill, so it's an easier walk. It's wonderful to get into the village. The dog and I have done that a couple of times. Many people who walk do that. I think, Ray, your wife goes into the village quite a lot. Uh, my dog is much smaller, and we don't tend to do that. Um, but thank you for your consideration. I know there's speed considerations that I think Joe speaks to much more effectively than I do. So, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> do we have the authority to... <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that you uh, refer this to the Police and Highway Department for review. There are rules in the town, there's rules in the... the Statutes in the, in the uh, I'm sorry. Statutes in the town and the town and we have to adhere to. So, I, the way I understand it, and I think this could clear up some of the uh, confusion with the multiple 35 and 25. Um, the way I understand it is the town would have the authority to uh, um, amend the speed limit down to 25 on any of the paved portions. So, from the village town line on the east end up to the intersection of Shirtliff, where the paving ends, and on the west end from where it begins and ends at Mill Road Bridge, all um, east up the hill to about Twin Ponds where the um, paving ends, and then it does get a little different on the gravel road, um, but it would be simple to adopt an ordinance um, for the paved portions. Down to 25. I would, uh, I would suggest that we follow the manager's suggestion and uh, go that route. And thank you very much. Is there any more that I can do? Uh, not Should I talk to the no. highway department? No. no. Should I talk to the highway department? No, it's. Or my neighbors? It basically boils me? down to a, whether or not we can actually do it. Uh, there are some state regulations re requiring as, engineering as studies. As Joe has talked about. The, yeah, I think the engineering studies are to go below 35 on gravel, but the paved portions would not have that. I'm not aware of that distinction, so. That's well, my understanding. I'm not uh, making a. Get your heads together. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out. Make a if we can do it legally, right. we'll do it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Or we'll, we'll consider it. Let me say right. that. Right, I understand. Thank you, Bush. <laughs> Frank, resolution for signing authority. Yeah, there's, there's an inconsistency between my contract and the state statute for town managers. I just want to be clear that you authorized me to sign documents that you have approved for my signature. Um, I'm just concerned about the inconsistency between. I'll make a motion, we do. I second. Motion's been made and seconded <coughs> that we. Uh, yeah, the resolution. Adopt a resolution. Thank you. All those, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I stand it. Okay. All right. So now we want to have some discussion about the uh, dangerous and vacant building property ordinance. Uh, David is here to explain his concerns or comments about that. I don't, were you giving the ordinance in your packets? Mm -hmm. no. Okay. So uh, I'm dealing with a building now, and I noticed two things that may need to be changed on page four. There's uh, a section that states the building safety officer may also seek the imposition of fines in accord with section nine of this ordinance. That should actually read section eight. So I'm asking for that change. 
And then if you do open this up and are willing to make the changes in the letter to inspect the building, we're telling them we will send them a copy of this ordinance. I would ask if we could uh, include a link to the ordinance rather than sending all the paper. Dave, where is this building located? <clears throat> What's the problem with it? Uh, at this time, I'm still in the investigation stage, so. So how do we actually make those changes to an, to an existing ordinance? Make a motion? Yeah. Okay. So do I we make, make a, motion. a motion to approve the changes or adopt a new one? I would like you to make a motion to accept the changes. I've written just because of what we've had the problems before with resolutions and getting the wording where mm -hmm. it gets to be something was changed but not really changed. Um, I wrote it as a revision, removing all language and redoing. So I don't know if you want so to do it that way. We'll accept the new, the new revision building one. ordinance as corrected. Yeah. Motion has been made. I'll second it. I'm seconded to accept the new ordinance with the revisions. Any further discussion? I have one question or a comment. The unusual person who would not have a computer or be able to access this, of course you'd send it to them. Oh, absolutely, if they ask for it, yes. But Thank I don't you. think it needs to be sent every time. Because yeah. most of us <coughs> I know, most of us do. Yes. But there's every yep. now and then. There are people in your house. Um, while we're on that subject, did you look to see that the state statute allows this ordinance? Remember that came up in the last meeting? Allows the because dangerous building ordinance? Yes. Yes. It does. It was because of the uh, lack of a charter. The lack of a charter. That was for the. Uh, no, that's that was for the uh, SDRs. Yeah. Oh, but this yeah. one is okay. This, this is uh, okay. yep. definitely allowed. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. It's and been second. seconded. And any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And the ayes have it. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. Now we have the. Can I use your track? <laughs> He's putting all his papers <laughs> in my. So now we have the bids for the sidewalk shoveling. So. Uh, I meant to get to you. Could, could we just have an update on this? Uh, what this? These are all the sidewalks that the village is responsible for. Uh, I believe the town is now. Responsible yeah, but the for town. Them, but I'm, yes. I'm, okay. I'm yes. sorry. Wow. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it should be. I'll never live that one down. Okay. Go ahead. All right, so uh, prior to Frank's arrival, I knew it was getting close to the season, so I started investigating this and see it hadn't been sent out. Found the file, and in the file, Phil had made some notes. They made perfect sense to me, so I included them in this bid and wanted to see what would happen. So the couple big changes from the prior year bid are twofold, really. So the first one is that they will salt prior to every storm to hope uh, to end the icing, uh, sticking to the sidewalk and taking more to get that ice up. And then also, every storm that is over three inches, they will clear every three inches. So if it's only a three inch storm, they'll wait to the end. If it's a six inch storm, they're gonna do it once in the middle and once at the end. So the big difference is with this is that Phil was usually on top of sidewalk maintenance and would call and say, come out and shovel, you know, come out and saw. Um, <clears throat> but I think it presented some problems um, during the winter with pre-maintenance and, and keeping up with the snow and the complaints that we, well, I know that he got. So we sent the bid out and we got one bidder back and you see the. <clears throat> so, so 
What about the sidewalks in the green? Yep, that includes them. But they don't salt those. No, that, that obviously any dirt won't be salted. Okay. But that'll be sanded <coughs> throughout the store as they would salt. And how does this cost compare to last year? Um, I'm not sure what the... It's the about account. a $50 per time increase okay. from so, last year. From so these are all of all the sidewalks in the village? These are all town-owned owned sidewalks. Oh, no. I can run through them. Yeah, let's have an update yeah. on what they are. So the rec center bridge on the south side of the west end of River Street. River Street north side at the west end of the street from crosswalk to the intersection of Mountain Ave. South side of the green from Court Street to People's Bank or to the green. Court Street along the chain link fence across from the new spa. Central Street Post Office Bridge, both sides. The path and footbridge between Mechanic Street and High Street. Cross Street Bridge on one side, only one sidewalk there. Uh, Upper Pleasant Street Bridge on one side. Elm Street Bridge, both sides. Elm Street Bridge to the end of Guardrail. Sidewalk along River Street Cemetery. The footbridge at Vale Field between Maple and Vale and the path between Vale Field, Footbridge and South Street. South Street sidewalk between Terrace Street and Linden Hill. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Central Street along Tribune Park. Middle covered bridge, sidewalk side near Iron Fence. The sidewalk at the triangle right in front of the covered bridge, known as the little green there. Uh, everything in the green, um, north, uh, east, east, west, and then two paths north to south. The welcome center from crosswalk to the front door only. Uh, the island at Elm and Central. And the kiosk west of the post office and both sides of the bridge. So we went back to the bridge. And also all crosswalks will have the plow berm cleared anywhere they intersect with a crosswalk. So the only thing to realize is with this is at $1,000 a time, that's only roughly when the budget, 14 times around. So do we furnish the salt? We furnish the salt and the sand, okay. yes. Yep. Next question, um, the last contract, you said it's $50 more per time. Was the last contract a three-year contract? It was a three-year contract, and I think the biggest difference was that it went from every three in, from every six inches to every three inches. So, so this time you're suggesting, well, the, the way the contracts are written, we can only go out fourteen times. Well, no, fourteen that's what storms. You have budgeted for so. And how many times were we called out last year? Uh, I wanted maybe best to answer. Uh, a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think on average at least once a week, sometimes multiple times a week. Well, what Phil would often do is let it build up to maybe more than the six inches if it was the end of day or these people didn't have unfettered access to come in and maintain sidewalks, if you will. So we might have done something quite dangerous. In this contract. Yeah, it could have been. Well, no, but we are, we're giving, we're we're giving a, a clean, right to clean every three inches. A we clean sidewalk right policy is what we're asking for with this contract. Which is very nice, but we may not be able to afford it. Correct. When, when they say $600 per time, is that 600 for every three inches? Or yep, once around is $600. That's a lot of shovel in the. If it's a continuous storm, uh, every three inches they'll be doing it two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we ha I think I had more complaints last year about our sidewalks 
than a lot of than the roads. So I think uh, we need to pay. Well, it was a tough year, but the bidder did question the three inches because of the six, six inches, and he was worried about um, what happened. Was they had all these grand plans approved it. And then three storms in, they submitted a bill for eleven thousand mm. dollars, and went, "Oh, wait, stop!" Mm. And did this on-call thing, which is very hard for them to do because they can't plan their schedule. So that's why he asked before he submitted his bid to make sure that we weren't going to be doing this. Mm. You know, we're going to call you type thing. And where is this contractor coming from? Bethel. Bethel. Um. Well, I think the sidewalks are important. I, I, I make a motion to accept this. Should you at least have a, um, I'm sorry, do you need a second to reply? Yes, and then we'll discuss. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. Any I'll further I'll discussion? Second. Yes. Should you at least have a clause that says, if the storm is overnight, <coughs> you ignore the three inch thing to, to cut that down? Sure. I mean, you otherwise, know. you might clear it at six o'clock and then nine o'clock. For, then... for, for a person who's in the business, that's a tough thing to do. It really is. To not, yeah. to especially let it, let it coming from yeah. Bethel. Yeah. Wait, the longer you wait, the hotter it is. Is this a local resident? No. No. no it's Bethel. Bethel. Same Bethel. guy they did but last year. I'm just oh, suggesting yeah. that they don't yeah. come out in the middle of the night, they come out in the morning. Yeah, but yeah, the yeah. problem with that is when the snow builds up six, eight, ten inches, it people. takes a lot, yeah. a lot yeah. longer yeah. to do it. I'm suggesting that actually not many people walk between nine no, and eight. No, but it doesn't matter walking, it's just. Coming in the next one and clearing that amount of snow is more difficult. And if I was a snow contractor, I'd still charge you for every Just three inches. Minute. Okay. Just a minute. Okay, go ahead, Jeffrey. Well, well one of the problems we face is that, uh, don't forget every, everything that David was talking about is certain sections. It does not cover anything mm -hmm. in front of the businesses, does not cover private residences. So they could be totally clear, and then you have all this snow, and then a little bit of clear, and then all this snow, and it, it doesn't work. Um, I'm not saying I have a solution, but unless we somehow had everyone in this town say, okay, let's just clear all the sidewalks and have it paid for by the people, mm -hmm. and then it could be done all at once. I but doing it this way, it, to me, it, it, uh, I think we went down that road once before, Jeff, and it got badly defeated. But, well, okay, but then why go to this extra expense? <coughs> because when they're you're going they're to have all of this. Because <coughs> those, those 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 sidewalks are our responsibility. We we'll, we want to take care of our responsibility. I I understand, but the reality is that that level of taking care is not what's going to happen in front of the residences. And, or, and the businesses, uh, unless we change the law, the ordinance. Um, and so it's going to be so incredibly uneven. Do you want to go to that expense and not have it be <coughs> functional? Uh, that's what I'm saying. So as um, someone who doesn't drive and relies entirely on walking, um, the, the issue that I had was not really snow. I mean, people were responsible. It's ice. You know, like if you don't have snow for a couple of days, you know, walking to the max, for instance, um, the, where the, um, uh, you know, the, um, well, actually both sides of those, terribly icy. And then even also walking here um, in the wintertime where there's not a lot of light and it can be very, very icy along. Um, Remember, these are for village or for town mm -hmm. sidewalks only. Mm -hmm. What's in front of the private residence or whatever is a different issue that has to be discussed at some other time. What we're here to do today is to approve this bid. Uh, John, did you have a comment? What we're here to do is to approve this bid for uh, the town-owned sidewalks. And I think I have a motion. I, just, I, I might just add one thing. Um, David alluded to it, but if we have a busy winter, you're going to exceed your spending budget yeah. significantly. Yeah. You should do that, obviously, consciously. It's, mm. you know, can I ask a, not can that I, we can change anything. 
David, you've put more thought into this than any of us, so do you have any ideas? Um, it's a tough, it's really tough. You have to weigh people who want to walk. What a person can do if you said, you know, leave it at night and there's nine inches that has been trampled on, it may take them four hours, it, it, it's, it's really tough. And what did you say our budget is? $14,000. $14,000. Yes. And the three storms in one year, we had $11,000. That could be mid-December. Yeah. I, I put out the bid for the Cadillac version to let you guys decide what you would like to do. I know it was a tough winter last year with the ice and the snow, and there's a lot of complaints. We do have time to rebid it. So you choose if we can come up with better wording. But is there, a, what's the next version to the Cadillac version that actually is worthwhile doing <coughs> that anybody might accept? I, I, would, I would think it'd be per call out that somebody would have to monitor the sidewalks and tell this guy, get here as soon as you can. If, I don't think he's going to drop his other projects, but he'll put us on the rotation and be in a couple hours to start dealing with sidewalks. No one locally expressed an interest at all. No. Because Bethel is... Oh, he's the same one that did it last year. He worked for them. Yeah. He worked for them. Yeah. And I can tell you that as somebody that Phil sent Mary and I to check the bridge, every single day when we would get the mail. We went to the post office. We had to check the bridge, Mechanic Street, and the yeah, Welcome, Welcome Center. Center. So what's the worst <coughs> that we could go over budget? Oh, gosh. Another, I mean, well, what was <laughs> How it? many did we have left? How many 14, time? another 14, another thousand dollars, another 14. Well, if you do it every one, if you do just one storm a week, that's a thousand dollars. So in, in two and a half months, you've yeah. eaten up your budget. And winners, four months. Well, we could say we vote for it and we vote for what we really want, and then we kind of see how much it costs after the fact, which is maybe not responsible, but it's real. Instead of doing roads, we'll do the same. <laughs> yeah. Just say. I know this is blasphemous, crazy talk, um, but you're going to be going into the budget season. Have you ever considered? like buying the little sidewalk cleaner and just cleaning the sidewalks for everybody. We did that. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know we did a few years ago. I was at that meeting. People Maybe change, it's time to bring it up stores again. change. Maybe it's time to bring it up but, again. Good idea. But that's not this issue here now. I know, but I'm just saying, I just yeah. wanted to put that out there because I know it's budget season. If somebody wants to, Talk about doing all the sidewalks, like so. <laughs> but that would be for the budget that would start July 1 next, next you know, year. This That's is the true. one we're in true. now. But with just throwing it out. I'd be in favor of that if we could give the sidewalks back to the village. <laughs> uh, pay for it by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I like the idea. So, here are we here. Do I have a motion on the floor? Yes. Yes, and it's seconded. And it's seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 So we'll go with this, and when we're out of money, we'll move, move to Florida. No. <laughs> I voted no. <laughs> you voted no. Yep. I just don't, I just... That money will be gone by December if we have a year like last year. All right. Manager's report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll try to be very succinct. Um, I thought I'd kind of bring you up to date on what I consider to be my objectives here over the next few months um, in no particular order, but I think it kind of follows. The fiscal 2019 is basically complete. The auditors uh, have been in. 
the uh, draft report should be uh, at your November select board meeting, uh, the November trustees meeting. Um, I think uh, we have completed all the journal entries for anything that has been that needed to be corrected. Uh, I think things are in really pretty good shape. Um, and that kind of segues into the, uh, the budget discussion. Uh, Beth and I discussed this afternoon that we have budget uh, worksheets uh, ready and we'll be disseminating those <laughs> to the uh, department heads uh, to begin the budgeting process on an operational basis. Uh, we'll also be working with the department heads to uh, to uh, develop uh, some capital discussions for you to chew on at some of your subsequent meetings. Um, and I'm, I'm really getting pretty comfortable with the, uh, with the finances and the budget and the process and the rest of it. Um, as we talk about capital budgeting, uh, we're going to have to look at a variety of, of different things, but and again, in no particular order. You heard an interesting discussion about the uh, this building. Um, as Jill pointed out, the committee uh, will meet in October and begin a, a discussion uh, with an architect to uh, really talk about where it goes long term, and also I'm, I'm hoping that we have some discussion about where we go short term. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some things that, that could be done to this building. Uh, some of it cosmetic, some of it is minor fix, but uh, there's certainly work to be done. The emergency uh, services building, uh, we've been meeting with an architect and, uh, and the, the principals, uh, the fire and the, and the, and the police. Uh, we've worked on some cost reduction, hopefully some cost reduction thought processes. And within a week or two, we should be able to schedule a public information meeting. Uh, we've toyed with the idea, I think, between three and seven, kind of an all day or all early evening gathering where people can come and we'll have a, oh, um, either a video or a, uh, Tour and open house. Tour, open house. Uh, maybe if we can find an extra few bucks, we'll have some cider and donuts or something. It's kind of getting toward that time of year. But just so that the, the folks in the community get a chance to see the, the uh, situation that we're living in today and the things that, that need to be done there. The, um, the sidewalks are an interesting discussion in this community. Uh, listen here intently tonight, but um, an analysis of the inventory is almost underway. <laughs> I think tomorrow you may see some people with a wheel and a notepad uh, beginning that analysis. Um, we need to develop some strategies <coughs> to uh, upgrade incrementally uh, or fund a major project and, and really put a fix on the, on the uh, on the sidewalk issue through the uh, through the village, um, some improvements would certainly make uh, winter maintenance easier. Um, it's kind of hard in some cases to go to bare ground or to go to, to a bare sidewalk situation where you you have peaks and valleys as you're walking down the sidewalk. The, the other area that uh, probably could be covered uh, further down the agenda, but well, I've got the floor. Um, just an update on wastewater facilities. Uh, these would necessarily not be funded with taxes, but would be funded with, uh, with uh, increases in user fees. Um, as I told you a month ago, I apologize for a month ago, I was at the very apex of a about of Lyme disease, and I don't remember a whole lot of what I might have said at the last the last board meeting. But nevertheless, um, the Tashville uh, 
project uh, should be, uh, Daniel should be finished there, um, I think by the end of this week. And then there's a, a coating that will go on that will take another couple of three weeks as it um, is applied and, and dried. Um, and in the meantime, uh, this business as usual, we're moving stuff up to the main plant for processing. The, um, you agreed at the last meeting to uh, a development of a design um, or an evaluation, if you will, of the South Woodstock uh, facility. That should go to construction next summer. That, that facility is, is aging. Um, and immediately following that, um, preliminary engineering should begin on the main plant. Um, a lot of that technology is, should be getting social security checks. It's that old. Um, and it's, it's, it's worn. Um, The um, sludge issue that we had uh, has been resolved. Uh, we won't need to deal with sludge until sometime late next spring. Uh, that process <coughs> worked out in a week. We emptied uh, we emptied the two tanks. Um, <coughs> some facility in New Hampshire is the recipient of the in a landfill situation of the of the, uh, the solid stuff. And um, the water went back through our plant for recycling. Um, the other project that you know I'm involved with uh, to assist the, uh, the search committee uh, in the manager search, uh, it's in my best interest to make sure that <laughs> this all moves fairly rapidly so that I can get on with my retired life. <laughs> um, but I. Uh, We'll try to make myself available to the greatest extent possible to keep this process moving so that you find a new person. Uh, just as an aside, I did have a discussion with, with the league uh, this afternoon, and there are already five resumes in, the, in hand, so there's interest, and we've only been in the marketplace for a week or so. Okay. That's good. Uh, I'd be happy to do questions, or I'd be happy to just put my papers away and go on to the next agenda item. I have one more for you. Um, uh, a few months ago, we were presented with a proposal for all access infotech, looking at our um, computer systems, and I wondered where we got to with that. We uh, have not moved forward with that. We've we've asked an individual to do a uh, an assessment, uh, kind of independent of that. Uh, that proposal was was frightfully expensive in the beginning and frightfully expensive going forward mm -hmm. uh, for the little system that we that we actually have here. It was, a, it was really pretty much over the top, so we wanted to take a second look at that before we continued on that path. Thanks, Frank. Uh, you want to discuss this now, Frank? You want to discuss um, that? I kind of had that under other business, but well, I can do it now. It's let's, simple. Let's <laughs> the, uh, the state came by, and I'm, I guess I'm a little late on this. It probably should have been done at your September meeting. Um, and I don't know the name of the bridge, but it's the bridge that goes out 106 toward the Elm Street Bridge. Elm Street bridge. Uh, that has a wooden plank sidewalk. And the state... Uh, they showed pictures of people putting their foot through it, but <laughs> David and I walked across both sides of it, and uh, there are some boards that need to be replaced um, that I think will get done here shortly in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we, we need to take a hard look at, uh, at replacing the, the decking in total. Um, I think we did that how many years ago? Probably 20 now. Okay. Not quite that uh, much. Still quite well in the 20 years. Some of the, some of the curbs are all spotted out, three fires shot. Mm -hmm. on the no, well, I, I didn't hear they, they were only concerned with the, with yeah. the sidewalk decking. Um, but we may as well, 
in, in the process, we may as well take a look at that bridge and, and uh, maybe get it in the queue for work somewhere down the road. But uh, this requires your signature saying that you've seen this. We brought it to you. Um, otherwise, they get no one seen it. A little antsy about giving us money. I didn't see it. Did you? Mean? What? It's <laughs> done. So, do they give us a grant for all of this work? So, you need a motion to. Uh, I think, Jill, what was your question? You, you said they get antsy about giving us money, but are they, they're not paying, we're paying for this, right? I'm sorry? We're paying for this work. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's our bridge. Are these side planks uh, okay? I think uh, when you do the deck, you do the underplanking at the same time. <coughs> you rip it up and put it in. Um, last, last time they did that, they had... Uh, <laughs> they had them drilling holes for the planks to meet the holes in the bridge, and that's a terrible hard situation. Uh, Line them up. If they just have uh, a big, you might as well say a big washer on the back, they could, where, where they break, mm -hmm. they could just have a big washer <coughs> on the back and they wouldn't have to re-drill holes. Like with about two weeks drilling holes there, and, mm -hmm lighted everything up and it'd be a lot easier to do it that way if it, you know if, it was, if they have to be replaced so all right all right i'll leave some notes is there any uh, any other business here we you have to approve this thank you it, it, yeah we just have to sign it yeah i mean what is there to approve no, the you need a motion See, yeah. Um, I think if you sign it. Yeah, fine. we just sign okay, it. Okay, just yeah. sign it. Great. Yeah. Yeah. We'll sign it after, right? You then you have it first. Uh, <laughs> so the okay. next. The I next. Had, uh, if I could, Mr. Chairman, one more thing under my yeah. report. Um, on a personnel basis, uh, David was very integral in the in the transition, um, and it's my intention to keep him very much in municipal manager loop so that the transition from my time here to new person um, is going to be as seamless as possible um, he's been a great help to me and i just want to publicly say that and i much all the know i'm going to keep him in the loop yep. as we go forward great okay That's a good idea. thank you Good idea. I had something for that. I finally got Frank broken in. He's <laughs> doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough, huh? <laughs> okay, so anything else before we move on to truck permits, John? Yes, I reviewed those and they all seem to be in order, so I recommend we approve them. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. We approve the truck permits. Did I hear a second? Oh, yes, I yes. second. Uh, second. All the, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Now, Board of Sewer Commissioners, do we have any business for Board of Sewer? I think I kind of covered that. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I think you did. Quite well. Yep. Thank you. All right. So, uh, you want to go into the executive okay. session now? Can we do the financial statement? Yeah, we can do that. Your package includes a, uh, an abbreviated form of the first two months of the year. Um, we've been through, I mean, I think you all realize that we do this. Uh, on a monthly basis, and it's not a, uh, it's not phased as to when we actually spend the money, so it's not a real interest, it's not a real, well, it is what it is. Um, if you have any questions about the, uh, the monthly financials and want to stop by and talk about it, I'm more than happy to go over details. Um, someday in a perfect world, you'd have a budget that would recognize the sequence of spending as opposed to just 112, 212, 312, and 412. Um, these things are loaded to uh, accommodate uh, winter 
overtime and, and all kinds of different things like that. Uh, and they're not really designed to be anything other than 112, 212, 312 on the road. Where did David go? Just vanished, vaporized. Yeah. Did you have some questions? Yeah. Well, you'll see him. I'll see him tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Make a mission file for approval minutes. Oh. Okay. Okay. We can do that. Then we can go into the All right. So we have three, four, four, four sets of minutes here to approve. August 20, August 15, August 20, and uh, September 10. Question and comment. Anybody? Well, Ray, Ray already made the motion. Oh, he did. Oh, he oh, did. I'll second that motion. Speak up down there. I'll speak up. All right, motion been made and seconded to approve the four uh, minutes. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. That's So we have to go into executive session. I move that we go into executive session for the discussion. I'll second it. Motion's been made and seconded to go into executive session. Any discussion? Include the manager and the police chief. Oh, do you want to do, have that formally in the motion? Sure. And we wanted John to be part John's of record. one discussion as well. But we have several, several executive sessions, things first. Uh, do those first you want me to come back or you want to do mine? So you want to do John and we'll do those appointments and then we'll do the, the contract. The conf contract. Yeah, All right. Yep. right now. Everybody okay with that? <coughs> yes. Okay. Yep. Tell me you leave? No. No? But no. You should be uh, TV should be off. TV should be off. You don't need executive.